It used to be called the Great War because it was thought man had won everlasting peace. And memorials and monuments to it were built all over the world. We see it today as the last of the soldiers' wars, which men were more important than machinery. But half a century ago, those who fought believed it was the war to end all wars. Sixty-one thousand names are here, the first Australians to die in a European war. Only for them was the peace everlasting. The names of many of those who survived it are to be found in the files of the repatriation department. The facts are here, name, age, record of service, medical history. But the forms don't tell you what went on inside a man's mind. You can't turn a page and find out what it's like to have your youth drained away in battle. It starts in far-off Sarajevo, when a young student assassinates the Habsburg heir. But within four days, taken drought and elections from the local headlines. Recruiting calls from past wars are taken out and repolished and promises are made to stand behind the mother country to help her and defend her to our last man and our last shilling. By the 2nd of August 1914, Australia has undertaken to supply 20,000 men. Within weeks, cattlemen become cavalry. Horses and men bred for the grasslands of the outback are taught new skills in preparation for service in a very different landscape. It will all be over by Christmas, say the newspapers. They'll never leave Australia's shores. But the training continues harder than ever. The urgency is not that of crisis. With the last major conflict a hundred years in the past, these raw soldiers are able to believe in the glory of war. They talk about the hero's death in which there is no suffering, only the splendid sacrifice for a noble cause. So, in the beginning, the goodbyes are for men with stout hearts. It is as well they will need them. For although in 1914 Australia is a young nation, its casualties over the next four years will exceed a quarter of a million. Later, they will leave under cover of darkness, and a voyage will be a dangerous exercise. But in the beginning, it's just like an ocean cruise, a grand occasion. And then, with the first sight of foreign lands, the adventure begins. Enthusiasm is unleashed, for only leagues away is the enemy and the opportunity to teach him a well-deserved lesson. And at this desert training ground, in the backyard of battle, the digger philosophy is born. Compounded of bush law and mateship, resourcefulness and loyalty, it is the quality which will make them the best of spearhead troops, with the highest casualty rate in the empire. But on the 25th of April, 1915, the romance will begin to assume a different look. Earl Evans landed at Gallipoli on the first day of the invasion. He was wounded there. A bullet passed through his knee. He was one of 24,000. It has been decided to seize the narrow neck of land that guards the Dardanelles Straits the Hellespont of the ancient world. The prize is the pathway to the Black Sea and the Russian allies, the opposition a supposedly impotent enemy. The operation has been planned four months ahead, but by April the well-informed Turks outnumber the attackers by two to one. Things go wrong from the start. The Turks hold unassailable cliff-top positions. Plans go awry, communications are unreliable. The advance is uneven.
within months, this rugged no man's land will become the center for recriminations, accusations, and post-mortems. And while politicians in London argue about what went wrong, at Gallipoli, romanticism dies in a fly-blown hole in the ground. Those who live through it will know that wars cost blood, pride, and human decency. The reconstruction shows aspects of valor and moments of triumph in a clean war that never was. Memory has sterilized history. Gone is the stench of stale blood and human refuse, and forgotten the other enemy, disease. Many escape Turkish steel, only to fall victim to the ravages of dysentery and typhoid. In December, the High Command admits failure and orders the evacuation of the peninsula. The Commander-in-Chief expects to lose half his force in the withdrawal, but the operation is impeccably carried out. There are only two casualties, but the earth they leave behind holds 10,000 of their comrades. Bert Ogden fought in and Palestine. He was one of the 40,000 horsemen to charge at Beersheba. Their deeds had the ring of high adventure, but the romance was followed by 50 years of disability. The war in the northern desert is a very different affair from Gallipoli, but it too is the kind of which legends are made. General Harry Chauvel is part of the legend. He understands desert warfare and guides his men through one of Australia's most decisive and conclusive campaigns in the war. The armies that met at Gallipoli face each other again, this time on level ground. The tables are turned, the Turks defeated, but it takes three years of hard and bitter fighting. Forty thousand prisoners of war are taken in this campaign. Forty thousand defeated men, shuffling in a private no man's land, the debris of success. The victors enter Beersheba, and the wounded follow. Cachalos carry them victor and vanquished, away from the sands of war. If you're not dead when they put you in, you will be by the time they take you out. The reward of victory in this arid world is water, and when the day is won, the wells flow over. In the quiet after the battle, the medical corps does its best to repair damaged bodies. For the prisoners, there is the added pain of defeat. After the campaign come floods and disease. There is no sweetness in tomorrow. This is one of the lessons of war. After Gallipoli, the desert. And after the desert, the fields of France. This will be the cruelest lesson of them all. Joe Maxwell fought in France. He went through the mincing machine of the Western Front and escaped with his life and a Victoria Cross. He was 22 then. High Command has abandoned strategy. In its place is a new concept. The giants of war will stand and slog it out until one topples. In order to maintain a solid front, it is calculated that a steady supply of reinforcements will be needed at the rate of 2,000 men a day. By the time it is all over, the total casualties will be 14 million. It is an age in which the machinery of death has reached a high level of sophistication 
Some of the new guns developed before the war have waited as long as 20 years to be field tested. Death is achieved in a dozen different ways. Machine guns, though inefficient, are cheap. And as a result of research, the rate of fire is now high enough to cross-hatch the air and so herd in the target. Once pinned down, shell and shrapnel are found to be more effective at the rate of two to one. Barbed wire is added to a landscape already made cruel by flood, mud, frost and snow. Five men are fed into the mincing machine and it churns out corpses. The pauses in battle are just long enough to harvest the wounded and the dead. For those who are left, this is the worst time of all. The young men who answered so eagerly the call to arms two and a half years ago have vanished. They have been changed into veterans who have learned to live with the smell of sweat and latrines and to turn from the constant sight of wounded and half-buried bodies to pick the lice off their shirts. The talk has changed too. Nobody now speaks about the glory of war and the hero's death or teaching the enemy a lesson. At times it seems there is no enemy, just a tireless war machine that spits an endless stream of death across the naked battlefields and the only end in sight is the last shot fired from the last gun. Being wounded is a lottery. The serious cases lie mute, awaiting departure. They are the lucky ones. Even a minor wound, the loss of a hand or an eye, can take you back behind the lines. But the walking wounded only receive medical attention and are sent back. The wastage level must be maintained, 2,000 per day. More efficient weapons are needed, and it is thought that gun-bearing tractors might be armoured to become the invincible weapon. So 31-ton Little Willie is born. Sometimes whole platoons are wiped out in seconds, buried in trenches, trodden to death. But the newest weapon is the most sophisticated of all, gas. It leaves the ground virtually intact, yet poisons entire areas, and if the weather is favourable, affects the reserves almost as much as the front line. Masks are some protection, but mustard gas, which can be sent over in ordinary shells, works by contact with the skin, and it eats through clothing to get to it.
1917 closes on a land leached by blood. Already the war has exceeded in its scale of operations, the number of its casualties and the total of its costs, any previous known human conflict. But this immense destruction, both material and moral, cannot continue. The giants are tiring. Soon one must topple. At 6.50 a.m. on the 11th of November, 1918, the message goes out. Hostilities will cease at 1100 hours today. Troops will stand fast on the line reached at that hour. The machine that has run so mercilessly for four years is at last brought to a stop. Now begins the task of rebuilding, mending, repairing. The scarred buildings can be rebuilt. The war-torn fields can be sown again. But the men, they can never be made the same. who survive look on the last march and the last touch of gunmetal as acts of finality. They believe the war to end all wars has been won. They believe the prize is worth the price. They are going home to a golden peace, to a promised land fit for heroes. How could they know it would all begin again in the short space of two decades? The names of many of those who survived it are to be found in the files of the repatriation department. The facts are there. Name, age, record of service, medical history. But for the young men and women who serve the veterans today, the facts are not enough. They must know about the war, must translate the facts and understand what each man went through. They have lived through two wars and a depression. They are the remnants of an army which time and history have reduced to a mere handful. The war they fought involved the peoples of every continent, caused great empires to collapse, and was more terrible than anything then known to man. They are old now, and an old man recalls the good times and veils the suffering with sentiment. Let them forget, as long as others will remember their deeds for them.